Uh, welcome everybody to this week's uh, Green Bank Observatory Community Zoom. Just a couple of announcements before we begin. So the first thing I'd like you to see is this um, excellent um, series of photographs of our uh, GBT training workshop. Uh, we had a lot of participants, um, very successful. Thank you all for those who participated and for those who were on the training side as well. So this is important to get our observers up to speed. And by all accounts, this was a smashing success. Uh, we are back on the air uh, after our summer maintenance. Um, we're actually starting to enter our high frequency season. It's been very uh, cold and clear at night. So we are uh, eager to get to our observations. Um, it's been a long time since we've observed a high frequency. Uh, the Time Allocation Committee uh, met here in Green Bank uh, last week. Um, the final disposition will be, I think, on election day, and then you should get your disposition letters within a week after that. So stay tuned. Um, those uh, disposition letters for your proposals will be coming. All right. And with that, I will hand it off to Dave Freyer, who will introduce today's speaker. Hi, welcome everybody. We're happy to have with us today Simon Dicker, who's from the University of Pennsylvania, and he's going to be talking about Mustang, um, the past, the present, and the future. So we're excited to have him here. Um, and as he's loading up the slides, I just want to remind people if you have questions um, but during the presentation, we'll take care of it after that talk. Just fill it in the Q&A box at the bottom. So thank you. Go ahead and take it away, Simon. Looks good. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let's start. And let's make that full screen. There we go. Yep. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, so Mustang 2, yeah. So I'm speaking on behalf of a big team of people, um, the Mustang collaboration. Yeah, goes back away, um, hence the title. Yeah, all started way back in the early 2000s, and we thought about what happens if we can put some bolometers on the GBT. There's this new telescope that can do high frequencies. Yeah. And here we are um, almost two decades later. So I will give a status report of where Mustang 2 is and what might come next. So thanks to many people who've been involved over the years, started to make a list and you know, ran out of room on the slide very quickly. So it's not just the people here at UPenn, but also you know, the team of engineers at Green Bank who've looked after the different receivers over the years and many colleagues and observers throughout the world. So, yeah. So Mustang 2, shown there in the middle, is the big green thing. Those aren't familiar with it. Yeah. I actually just go over its basic statistics. Yeah. So it's the only bolometer camera on the Green Bank telescope. Yeah. So it's... It's you know got a very wide band pass um and a four point two arc minute field of view and that's what gives it its sensitivity yeah we can map a region you know four arc minutes in diameter down to sort of you know seventy three micro kelvin or fifty six micro Jenskis per beam in just one hour and that has given it you know a great deal of different science cases yeah you know. but the instrument itself um whether people can see some, my mouse yeah it centers around this big yellow object there which is our array yeah we actually have 215 separate detectors in it yeah it's no re-imaging optics or anything must then one use them and as a show later um other experiments a bit thinking of putting on the green bank telescope also like to use them but instead, this just sits directly at the focus of the telescope. And that was one of the challenges, because the bolometers need to be really cold to work. In this case, you know, 350 millikelvin. Yeah. So you have to bear in mind that this is your vacuum window here, looking up at the secondary mirror of the telescope. And you've got 100 watts hitting that. Yeah. And your typical cooling power of the helium-3 sorption fridge that cools it, you measure in microwatts. So the filter stack here was one of the challenges we had building this. And the other challenge is just getting 300 millikelvin cryogenics to work on 
not an object like the GBT. Yeah. Because this whole cabin, if you've never been up there, tips by up to 70 degrees. And pulse tubes that we used to call it don't like being tipped. Hence the angle they're at there. Yeah. Reading out this many detectors, um, that was also another challenge when we built it. Yeah. We actually um you were the first instrument in the world to use what we call a microwave multiplexing system. Get into that in a bit. Yeah. So that's the very basics of the instrument. What have we done with it over the years? Um some of our main science has been with galaxy clusters you near know, the ESZ effect, yeah. And there'll be a Charles will be visiting Green Bank next week and he'll tell you more detail than I can. But the, the basic principle is, you know, there's a lot of galaxy clusters in the universe and they give out light at all sorts of frequencies, including the X-ray, optical light. As they get further away, they get harder and harder to see. But most of the actual gas and matter inside the galaxy clusters isn't actually in the galaxies themselves, but it's actually sort of spread out between them. Yeah. And that gas interacts with the cosmic microwave background as it comes towards us. And frequencies like 90 gigahertz, the GBT can see, that actually distorts the spectrum of the CMB. Yeah. And the great thing about that is it doesn't matter how far away that the, cl the cluster is. If there's a cluster there, you'll be able to see it using this effect. Yeah. Several experiments throughout the world with using it to do surveys. In particular, the ACT telescope was based down in Chile, the South Pole Telescope, and soon to be the Simons Observatory of doing surveys across the sky. The catch there is they have these enormous beams, typically around an arc mini in di diameter. So when they see these galaxy clusters, they get what you see as the cyan contours. Nice and round, it's pretty boring. You know. With Mustang 2 on the GBT, we're able to do follow-up observations and we've got the sensitivity to be able to detect you know, the point source in the middle. In fact, it isn't round. This is, in fact, a merging cluster. And with a sh though it's really hard to make it out on here, you know, there is, in fact, a shock wave you know, we've detected. And it's all because of the GBT's huge size, which gives us that tiny little beam compared with what most other telescopes get. You know. So as well as seeing you know, the details of the physics, we can start to look into how the profile of the gas, where it is in the cluster, how quickly it diminishes towards the outskirts. And you can also look at some of the astrophysics that's going on inside these clusters. You know, clusters aren't boring. They've got a lot of things going on in them. Some of the galaxies in the center might have very powerful AGN. In this case, the AGN is so powerful, it's blowing out you know, huge cavities in that gas that makes up the space between them and the clusters. Yeah. So that's a sort of flavor of some of the, you know, our bread and butter science we've been doing, but there's plenty of other things. You know, Mustangs observe between galaxy clusters. You know, there's a big problem in the universe, missing baryons. It's thought that a lot of them are just hiding between what we can see in the optical in the cosmic web. And in fact, Looking between two clusters of galaxies, you know, we were able to detect like a strand of matter going running between them as part of the cosmic web. Yeah. Yeah, closer to home, we've made use of its mapping speed. The, the maps here we typically make are around eight arc minutes across, so you're really concentrating your integration time on a small part of the sky. You can equally well spread it across a large part of the sky. In about an hour and a half, we're capable of mapping a square degree of the galactic plane, you know, down to you know, five sigma sensitivities of the order of two milligenesis. Yeah. Some of our recent work has involved some moving into the time domain astrophysics. Well, there was a tidal disruption event that went off, a star got swallowed up by a black hole, and along with many other experiments, we were able to monitor the decay the signal over time, giving information about what's going on around the black hole. We've done plenty of work with star forming regions, looking at dust around there. And really, you know, 
when you've got an instrument like the GBT with a sensitive camera and it's many sensitive cameras really, um, then it's pretty much your imagination you know, as to what you can do. You know. you know, coming up, um, it was just mentioned earlier that indeed high frequency season has begun. Feeling a little tired with three obs observing nights in a row. We installed the instrument two weeks ago. So thanks for all those that helped there. And we got our first observations on Sunday. Yeah. So on the schedule coming up, we've got more time domain astronomy, where we're actually doing coordinated observations with the X-ray instrument nicer. You know, the time delay. With Mustang sensitivity scale here is in seconds, you can actually see the sources pass through. And by looking at the delay in the signal, then you can actually start to work out some physics of what's going up around black holes. Yeah. We hope to be studying asteroids later in the season. Um, we've got projects open there. But I guess my heart really is back with the galaxy clusters. We're hoping to carry out a survey of a large number of clusters for point sources. Because point sources, you've got to remember, going back to the previous slide, you know, they can lurk around in these clusters and they're just not be not be seen by these survey experiments. Yeah. And they have to actually use models to subtract out the flux of them when they're doing cosmology with their cluster collections. But we can actually go and measure it and actually find the ground truth. Yeah. We've got more bridges. Yeah. In short, yeah, we're looking forward to a good season. Yeah. But yeah, there's a big but to all this, yeah. Mustang 2, yeah, you know, isn't what the GBT is capable of. Yeah, you know, we don't use its full field. You know. For our minutes, you know, 200 different beams sounds good, but in fact, the GBT is better telescope than that. Yeah. You know. In Mustang 2's detectors, yeah, you know, they're not fundamentally limited by the sky. You can make better detectors these days. And Mustang 2 is not polarization sensitive. That was a choice we made. And there's no spectral information Yeah, You have Argos on the GBT if you want spectral information. But yeah, if you're not after fine resolution spectra, then there's a proposal I'll show you shortly where we could just split the band in half and you'd instantly be able to tell you know, whether you're looking at dusty source, synchrotron source. Yeah. So start off with the field of view on the GBT then. Um, for those that haven't been up there, quite a view from the top of the receiver cabin on the GBT, all the way up there, just under the secondary mirror. The actual focus of the GBT is in the floor of the receiver cabin here that you stand in. But the giant turret where the eight different receivers live, uh, 24 or 36 inch holes, it rotates around to put the correct one in the focus. But the actual size of the area of the focus where the image quality is good, it's actually much larger than these receivers. Yeah, most of the time you're limited in the radio by just how big the feeds are. But at 90 gigahertz, the feeds are only 15 millimeters wide. And if you look down here on the left-hand side, We'll see what the optics people um, usually do, which is you work out the diffraction limit, which is the black circle and the green circle, depending on the frequency. And also you can work out what the geome geometric distortion is due to moving off axis. And you can see as you move off axis with a telescope, typically the first thing that cuts in is coma. Yeah, and you see that the rays of light coming in from the sky getting more and more distorted as you move off axis. But it's not until that the distortion is larger than the diffraction limit does do you take any hit in your image quality. So even out by you know with fields of view of you know, twice what Mustang has, you still got a good, good image quality. So you know the question becomes why not make use of it? Well, when we built Mustang 2, um we were limited, you know, by first of all, number of detectors you can read out. In order to make use of it, you've actually got to put in enough detectors. 200 detectors filled up four arc minutes, but 
we were limited by the fact that you can only read out 64 detectors on one chain of that Lumux readout. Yeah. But since then, um, technology has marched on and we've gone from being able to read out 64 to 1,000. Yeah. The optical elements were another limitation when we built Mustang 2. Yeah. Back then, the IR blocking filters we need to stop that power from the window from heating up the array have gone from 12 inches in diameter to over 40. Lenses, again, similar story. You couldn't get at the luminar lenses back then. Now we can AR code them up to sizes of 24 inches and silicon's available up to sizes of 18 inches. So the longer the short is really, it's time for an upgrade, yeah. So we have two proposals. Mustang 3, which I'll hit first, and also talk about Wicked, yeah. They will have fields of view, of almost six arc minutes, and Wicked is even more ambitious, it's slightly over eight arc minutes, yeah. So starting with Mustang 3, yeah. It's a proposal we're putting together at the moment. You see the picture is almost exactly the same, because when we built Mustang 2, we realized that technology would change and there was no reason that we couldn't make the cryostat window big enough that it could accept a larger field of view. Now, though the filters couldn't be larger, there's no reason we couldn't make the hole to put the filters larger. So in fact, that's what we did. So the first thing that we can do is simply to remove these filters, put more modern filters, and we'll get up to 5.2 arc minutes field of view. Field of view, um, as well as getting more detectors in, it's also important for trying to recover angular scales. It's, it's, it's extremely hard to recover angular scales, which are much greater than the, about half the size of your field of view, because everything else becomes common mode, and it will look very much like the atmosphere, and you take a big hit in noise, yeah. So in detector counts, um, what we are proposing is a much over six times more detectors, 1,200, certainly read out that many. But most, most of them will be for the fact we're actually going to, at the end of each feed horn, put four of these bolometer detectors into the one. On the left, you've got the Mustang 2 detector module. And what you have is an OMT here that sits in the back of the feed horn in the waveguide, picks off the X polarization, the Y polarization, and sends it into a single island here that's thermally isolated from the rest of this piece of silicon. Yeah. But modern D versions of these detectors that are used on experiments such as ACTPOLE, being deployed in Simon's Observatory, instead of sending those polarizations off to one island, actually send it off to four separate ones. So the X polarization gets split off here and filters in the strip line that send the power to the island, send part of the band here and part of the band here. So our proposal is to actually split the band in two. So you've got 75 to 90 gigahertz band and then 90 to 105 gigahertz band. And at the same time, split the polarizations as well. Now, if you're not interested in that, you'd obviously take a hit in noise if your detector isn't good enough. But in fact, as we've got you know, over the past decade or so, we've got better at making these detectors. And so at the moment, we can make these detectors such that they'll be background limited just by the random arrival of photons from the sky. So when you add them together, you actually, in fact, recover the same signal to noise as if we'd all fit them into one. But if you want to, you can also split the band or split into polarizations and get that, make use of that information as well. And all in all, um, as a bottom line, in total power, we could expect an increase of six to nine times in mapping speed for large areas. Don't quite gain as much for something small. Obviously, if you're looking at a point source right in the center of the array, it doesn't help to have lots and lots more detectors around the edge, simply because they won't be looking at it. Yeah. But all the same, the improvements in detector technology will still give you a significant increase in your mapping speed. 
So Wicked, um, his proposal led by Brad Johnson, which sadly um, got declined funding. Yeah, we're still keeping and hoping to be able to resubmit that, but actually involve a completely new prior stack and make use of one of the Green Bank Telescope's larger um, turret slots. Yeah, because it's using a larger turret slot, actually have a larger field of view, up to 8.5 arc minutes. But instead of using these bolometers, um, it's actually using a different technology, lumped element kid arrays as detectors. Yeah. These function very differently. Instead of just dumping power on a little island and measuring its temperature, you're using solid state physics where you have an absorber, which is a loop of superconductor. So the 90 gigahertz photons come in, they break Cooper pairs, it changes the induct inductance of the loop a little. Yeah. You couple the loop into a capacitor, and you've got a resonator, and that frequency of that resonator is going, you design it to be around a gigahertz, and as the photons come in, they change the resonant frequency slightly. So by monitoring that, what that frequency is, you've got a measurement of how much power is coming from the sky. Yeah. So again, this polarize, this experiment, yeah, the proposal, it was for dual polarization, but only a single band. Yeah. The larger field of view gives you much better mapping speed for large areas, but for small areas, it's pretty similar. Slight increase because we've squeezed the detectors closer together and made use of what are quite expensive, but very large lenses. Yeah. My, uh, the final challenge with this proposal is actually getting to the base temperatures you need. Mustang 2 operates at around 300 millikelvin, practice 350. Yeah, we need to get below 100 for this. Yeah, that's not been done on the Green Bank Telescope before. But it would certainly be a big step forward. So what we might we do with this? Well, um, we can do the same sort of science, but better. Yeah, because if we typical cluster our deep observations, you know, six hours for just measuring a cluster profile, or if you're trying to get something like that filament bridge between clusters, it's going to take over 20 hours. But with the new receivers, you should be able to get this down to one or two. I think it will mean one of several things, either more people get to observe with different targets, or people will start to ask for projects that just couldn't be done before. Yeah. Trying to observe protoclusters would take hundreds of hours plus staying two, Whereas Mustang 3, you'll be able to observe, you know, such projects actually become practical for the amount of observing time you get. And one thing I'd like to see happen, really, is some of, use some of that observing time for legacy surveys. You know, for example, you know, our galactic plane maps, if you were to do the whole galactic plane in polarization and in dual band, it would certainly be useful. The polarization aspects you know, um, and the dual band aspect does bring in the possibility of some new things. Um, it's not so useful for studying galaxy clusters, but it's certainly useful for, for studying things like the composition of asteroids on their surfaces and planet formation. All those things require polarization and the spectral information also becomes very useful. One thing we do is that with those galactic maps is combine them with both larger angular scales such as Planck, and smaller angular scales as armor this is adam's adam ginsburg's project some recent work that we're doing you can see the fine scales of armor have basically resolved out all the large scale structure but you can combine them and produce a map that contains both angular scales and all the flux one of the hard things is, of course, is that bands, band passes of the two experiments aren't perfectly lined up. So if you've got some spectral information by breaking our band in two, then that makes that such a com combination far more accurate, far more powerful. Yeah. So those are just a few of the ideas. I imagine some people on here might have others. So you know, please let us know. Yeah. But I'll just quickly cover some of the challenges and tasks we've got ahead in order to get these experiments going. Yeah. 
So the first is the low temperature cryogenics. Yeah, the Mustang journey was a long one. First of all, most receivers on the GBT operate you know, at 15. Yeah, we had to get down to three to 400 with Mustang, and we use the same types of fridges for Mustang 2. So we can carry that heritage forward. I've been pretty um, careless, really, would almost say, or because I didn't have to get much below 350. I used you know, big fat cables where I could so that they wouldn't break as easily. But there's nothing to stop us um, getting below 300, which is what will help give the individual detectors lower noise, Mustang 3, yeah. Wicked, that's a whole another development effort, and they're hoping to use ADRs for the refrigeration, yeah. So the large optics and windows, we know how to make them. Trouble is, they're expensive, yeah. and schedule is a real problem, but they are being used, so there's no reason we can't go ahead on that. It's going to be a challenge to get things in. You know, Crystats get very large, the picture at the bottom here of our latest one we built at the University of Pennsylvania for the Simons Observatory yeah. runs on five different pulse tubes. Yeah, it gets down to 100 millikelvin, but obviously it's not going to fit in that GBT turret. And in fact, the refrigeration system for the 100 millikelvin stage, the dilution unit, even just some of the warm temperature electronics would take up more space than we have here at the bottom of the receiver. Mustang receiver, which is shown there, installed in the receiver cabin of the Green Bank Telescope. Yeah. So we've got work on to do with the RFI control from here. These are all kicking out frequencies and, um, that we actually care about on the other receivers. So a lot of RFI shielding is going to have to be put in. There's operations and software, data analysis. But I think most of all, the thing that we've got to conquer. So if anyone has any rich friends, you know, these things come with quite a large price tag. Wicked is looking at over 5 million, really. And in practice, could be a lot more. And that's trying to cut as many corners as possible. And Mustang 3 is likely to come in around 1.6 million. So I think that's where we are today. I think we've got a bright future ahead of us. We're getting to make great use of the GBT and its abilities. But for now, um, yes. I look forward to be able to present in a couple of years on what we've done. So thank you. And a quick slide for you know, a collage of a few of the things inside Mustang. So thanks for all the people who've helped with Mustang projects over the years, and I'll take any questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, Simon. We really appreciate you um, summarizing the status of Mustang and giving an overview on where the team is going with the instrument. We'll open it up for questions. Go ahead, people, and put your questions in the Q&A box. We have a question already. Um, the question is, could you talk a, a bit more about asteroid studies for those of us who do solar system work? Okay. I don't know if Jack's on. He's the lead here. But um, we've done, actually, a map of the moon. Um, one of the, which was almost by accident, but, yeah, Mustang 2 has a high saturation power. That won't be the case with Mustang 3, but um, the um, one of the properties of 90 gigahertz is the waves actually um, penetrate somewhat into the soil of either you know, the lunar surface or the asteroids. Um, so you can actually start to get some information about what the asteroids are made of. And of course, if you monitor them over the course of a few hours, you get the rotation curve. Yeah, so you'll you, know, you don't actually resolve them, but as they, you know, your peanut shape comes end on or sideways, then you get different amounts of flux there. And that's certainly of interest as well. Yeah. Definitely not my area of expertise, but yes. Cool. Thank you. Um, another question. Should we directly contact you if we have potential science cases to contribute to proposals? And and the follow up associated with that. What timescales are the current proposals being prepared? Current proposals, wicked. Um, we're looking for a funding source for that. Um, sadly, the cost is out of the current range of available proposal tools. Um, Mustang three, I, I am actively writing right now. So please get in contact with me. <laughs> yes. 
I would love to hear from you. We'll be shout to a few people, but yeah, I'm afraid okay. I can't reach out to everyone. We'll send you the list of the participants. In. Okay, I really appreciate that. Um, another comment, a, a thank you <laughs> for could your I talk. Do, could I take panel prerogative and ask a question? Sure. So maybe this is a comment, but one other thing that uh, polarization capability would be very useful in is uh, mapping magnetic fields and cold dust clouds. So the this is a very difficult thing to do, but um, uh, Wicked or Mustang Three and Wicked should have that capability to trace the magnetic field structure on these uh, filamentary infrared dark clouds. That's an excellent point. It will open up a whole uh, new area of users, potential users for the instrument. Which, yeah, we'd be fighting over the same amount of time, but we'd be able to do better science is where I see it'll end up. Yeah. Whether we'll end up looking at fainter things or more people will be looking at the same things. I think that's going to be a question up to the tech. Yeah. We won't be fighting, Simon. We'll be linking arms and singing together. Absolutely. Yeah. Collaborative efforts. We'll be battling with Argus for the high frequency time. <laughs> but the the galactic people will have, well, never mind, the more star formation people, I think, will move over to doing Mustang related work with the polarization capabilities, as Jim has noted. I think that, yeah, will, I think that's will be its strongest case. Yes. And then also having the SED information, to, like you say, is it dust, synchrotron? Like, I think that will. There'll be some clever people who put in some proposals there. Yeah. So, okay. Um, we do have we have another question that came in. Any applications in gravitational lensing observations? Hmm. So you can do high redshift stuff as surveys. <laughs> Can't think of anything offhand. Um mostly because everything I know about gravitational lensing has been done in the optical. Um could we image something there? Um, I'm thinking something simple, just high redshift yeah. galaxies at three millimeters. They'd be extreme. The high redshift ones would yeah. be extremely red. <laughs> mm. So having the two bands, well, anyway, you might be able so to help. Certainly anything that the idea of splitting the bands, yeah, basically came out of that sort of thing. Yeah, being able to tell, you know, it's important for the cluster work um that these sources can infill the signal from the cluster and when you're trying to estimate the mass of the cluster from the signal you, then you don't know um what, whether that source is there or not so you have to model it out but knowing the what the population is and whether it's you know with a dusty star forming galaxy or a synchrotron you know sources then that's really useful and um that's one of the things where yeah, I really would hope to make use of that. Yeah. Cool. Um, do we have any other questions? I I will send you, Simon, an email. That, well, it'll be in the, the chat. There's some email addresses of people who are interested in um, may, helping to discuss the asteroid case, and I'll send you their contact information. I also put it in the chat, but I'll just send that to you offline, Simon. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah. Are there further questions from participants? Okay, if not, we're going to go ahead and um, end our community Zoom today. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and thanks, Simon, for presenting these results. And we were really excited at the observatory for the future capabilities of the, the yep. three millimeter barometer observations on the GBT. Um, We'll have another community Zoom in two weeks, and the topic is H1 and ultra diffuse um, galaxies. So, yeah, so, and maybe you could add, yeah, go ahead. There, there's the talk Charles has given on the SC. So, if anyone's interested in that, yeah, he's going to be visiting. So, yeah, that's, so that's right. He's giving the colloquium at our observatory next yeah. week. So, we do, um, we do broadcast those as. So, okay, thank you for that reminder, Simon. So, okay, um, we'll go ahead and end this now. Thank you very much, and thank you, Simon. Okay, Have a great day, everybody. Bye.